Let's turn now to the Indo-Pacific, where friction over Taiwan, the South China Sea, and other flashpoints have the region on edge. Last year, conservative U.S. lawmakers proposed an Indo-Pacific version of NATO to help Asian democracies defend themselves against growing military threats from China and North Korea. DW's East Asia correspondent James Chater now takes a look at the challenges to the region's stability and whether they might herald a new era of security alliances. Across Asia, growing friction at geopolitical flashpoints. South Korea and Japan say this North Korean intercontinental ballistic missile fired last month can hit anywhere on U.S. territory. And in the new year, Pyongyang is vowing to step up war preparations. Elsewhere in the South China Sea, China also last month fired water cannons at Philippine vessels as long-standing maritime tensions spilled over. Beijing said ties with Manila are at a crossroads. And in Taiwan, which China claims is its own, an election is just days away. Chinese officials, even Taiwan's main opposition party, have cast a vote as a choice between war and peace. None of these flashpoints are new. But as 2024 begins, what is changing is China's and North Korea's growing assertiveness, not to mention both countries deepening ties with Russia. Three nuclear armed states, three powers increasingly frustrated with a US-led world order. Among Washington's partners in Asia, including here in Taiwan, all that's prompting a fundamental rethink of risk. Governments are scrambling to boost defense budgets and forge alliances around the region. Japan has passed a record defense budget for 2024. And despite historical grievances, Tokyo is drawing closer to South Korea, here conducting joint air patrols last year. On top of that, Japan and the Philippines will soon begin talks on access to each other's military bases, with the Philippines last year granting the US access to four more of them. In Taiwan, this is one response to increase Chinese intimidation. The Brave Eagle, a domestically made trainer jet used to prepare the next generation of fighter pilots, like Jiang Kaili. He graduated from the US Air Force Academy before returning to Taiwan. We are still we are learning from the US and uh, try to be stronger. So I'm not worried about, you know, the war or the fight from our opponents. But we, we won't start the flight fight uh, actively, but we are trying to be 100% ready if there is any possible war. And at this Taiwanese Air Force base, Washington's support is plain to see. Evolving threats to stability in Asia are posing bigger questions about whether that's enough and if the scope of the challenge posed by adversaries of the US might lead its allies in Asia to form a collective security pact similar to NATO. Because now nothing like NATO exists in Asia. NATO, which labelled China a systemic challenge for the first time in 2022, already has four partners in the Indo-Pacific, but those ties fall well short of collective defence full membership would guarantee. Countries of the Quad Security Dialogue have previously held joint military drills. The group also has no collective security pact, but China has long criticised it as an Asian NATO. And the US maintains mutual defence treaties with these countries in the region. NATO has previously shied away from strengthening ties with Asian partners, mostly over fears of angering China. But with Beijing's military might now rivaling the US, for many the reality has changed. And if China and North Korea's forceful actions continue, some say a NATO-style pact in Asia, once inconceivable, could come closer to reality. And let's bring in DW Chief International Editor Richard Walker, who joins us from the Taiwanese capital, Taipei, with more on that. So the report there, Richard, mentioned the possibility of a NATO-style defense alliance in Asia. Who might be part of it? Yes, yeah, so Sarah, we should start off, with, as James said, by, by emphasising that, that, that something like an Asian NATO really uh, is far off. But definitely these thought experiments kind of uh, are going on. And to take one example of one grouping that 
some have said, you know, potentially could form the kernel of some kind of NATO-style alliance in the future uh, is this grouping called AUKUS. That's between Australia, the United States uh, and the United Kingdom, obviously a country that's not even in Asia, but that is uh, an alliance based around submarine technology. And there's been some speculation, for instance, about whether Japan might join that at some point in the future or South Korea, both of those obviously countries that independently have their own uh, very close alliances with the United States. But we really should stress that this is a long way from the kind of collective defence uh, pact that NATO represents. The fact that that would mean that every single member of those uh, of such an alliance would have to jump into the defence of another if a, a war scenario did emerge. And if we're talking about a kind of a, a war scenario between the United States and China, for example, over Taiwan, that saw China then taking part shots at United States targets, then, for instance, South Korea would be liable to get involved, to be dragged into that conflict, to be committed to, be, uh, to join that conflict. That would put it at risk from North Korean attack. So you can see uh, the, the kind of level of commitment that would be involved in, in that kind of alliance. It seems the countries in the region are not really ready for that yet, but the fact that these thought experiments are going on is very telling about the security situation in Asia right now. Another option when we talk about the security front would be potentially strengthening ties with NATO. Give us a sense of the desire for that on both sides. Yeah, well, there was an active discussion about that in public last year when NATO did uh, propose opening what it called a liaison office in Japan. But that ended up getting nixed. The Europeans, and I think particularly the French, were very concerned about that. They thought that that was potentially too provocative uh, towards China. And I think that also shows that, that, that many of the countries that we're talking about here haven't yet felt that this is the time to really kind of cross the Rubicon in terms of relations with China and, and, and kind of commit to what would effectively be uh, the real crowning of, of a Cold War 2.0 that some say really has already begun. There's still a hesitation there, uh, a concern not to provoke China too much. Interestingly, though, it's really in the hands of China whether uh, an Asian NATO or something like it ever does emerge. The more provocative, the more assertive, the more aggressive even that China becomes within Asia, the more likely an Asian NATO is to emerge. DW Chief International Editor Richard Walker, thank you. Correspondent James Chater, who joins us now from the Taiwanese capital, Taipei. Welcome, James. Uh, let's start with that uh, last option mentioned in your report, the possibility of a NATO-style defence alliance in Asia. Who might be part of that? Well, it's likely those countries I mentioned in that report countries that are already NATO partners would be part of any kind of expansion of the dialogue and cooperation that already exists with Indo-Pacific partners. But it's important to, to emphasize at this point that the immediate um, expansion of NATO of any type of agreement is really quite unlikely to take place in the, the, the medium term. And the reason for that is we've seen over the last couple of years really efforts to, um, to establish, for example, a liaison office in Tokyo of NATO. That was much discussed during the G7 summit in Hiroshima last year, as, of course, uh, the summit was taking place in the Indo-Pacific and there was that renewed emphasis on the region. But what happened, interestingly, was later in the year, during the, the NATO summit in Vilnius, Lithuania, is that, that that liaison office in Tokyo was really pushed down the agenda. And we understand from reporting at the time that that was really um, at, at the, the, the efforts, really, of European powers who are really concerned that NATO, if they did establish this liaison office in the, in the Indo-Pacific, would be kind of overreaching its initial aim to, to protect the Euro-Atlantic sphere. Beyond that, of course, um, allies in the US allies really in the Indo-Pacific have been concerned about establishing a collective defence agreement like this because historically they've really preferred to operate on a purely bilateral basis. So that's why we haven't seen this type of collective security agreement really come to fruition um, despite the evolving challenges uh, that we see in the Indo-Pacific right now. And of course there's, there's always China to consider which presumably would see the establishment of any sort of uh, alliance in what it considers its backyard as being some sort of uh, major provocation. In short, yes, and that's exactly why we haven't seen that, for example, that liaison office come to fruition. Um, it, it's really understood that, that from the perspective of China, it's really thought that they've already concluded 
that the, the US really is pushing for some type of um, agreement, collective defense um, apparatus to be established in the Indo-Pacific, something which they've already promised would, would garner a resolute response. The really key context to all of this, though, is, of course, that the, the, the fundamental relationships that underpin countries in East, in, in East Asia and the Indo-Pacific is that, on the one hand, you have China, which is, for, for the vast majority of countries in the region, in some cases very much so, the largest trading partner and economic partner. And on the other hand, you have the US, which is often the chief guarantor of security. And so that's led some people to say, that you know, if we were going to see any type of collective defence agreement come to fruition, what we'd need to see first is a collective economic resilience and security cooperation come into fruition first, because that would need to be uh, in place really for US allies to feel comfortable that their economies wouldn't be so drastically impacted by any type of collective security agreement before they jump into um, a, a defence, a conventional defence agreement of that nature. Right. So is all that, as, uh, those sort of negotiations, those are going on behind the scenes, are, are they? Or is this now a, a sort of pressing um, uh, issue for, for countries uh, in that region? What do we do about China? Well, I mean, it's very much at the front of people's minds. Um, we've seen that, as I mentioned in that report, those geopolitical flashpoints are very much taking place in the open. And so how to deal with those combined threats um, are very critical, really, to how countries want to be dealing with that, that type of um, threat that they perceive from China and North Korea. Of course, as I mentioned, those discussions that took place around the NATO liaison office were taking place relatively in the open. The, 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 the pushback we saw from European powers was a bit more kept behind closed doors. Um, but really, um, we, you know, we, we see this type of um, concern being talked about much more openly, especially when you look um, at, at the, the various flashpoints that are coming into fruition and those, the, the, the relationships that are really being expanded below the threshold of formal security partnerships, like that relationship between Japan and South Korea, like that relationship between Japan and the Philippines, because what they're really trying to do is expand that level of deterrence, um, to, to expand the capacity, to expand the regional um, kind of uh, the variability, really, of the military capabilities of these countries so that they can dissuade China or North Korea from taking any type of military action against targets like Taiwan. Okay, thank you for that, James. James Chater in Taipei.